So, uh, you are here for the Selfish Accessibility Talk. Can, can everybody hear me? Do I need to use the microphone? Okay, I'll, I'll wing it and we'll see. So, um, I am your speaker today, Adrian Roselli. Um, I've got some stuff that says I know what I'm talking about. Good for me. Um, I'm a member of the HTML working group. Uh, I sit on the Accessibility Task Force and some community groups, which anybody can be a member of that, so it's not that big of a deal. I've been building uh, applications on the web, website, software, et cetera, since 94, and I have a, a software development company I've had for 17 years now. So I've, I've had the pleasure of messing up projects for a long time for a variety of different clients in a variety of different industries. And I say this because we, if any of you have been doing this, you all know we all screw things up and part of it is doing better and getting it right. Um, I have a Webotron site, which is common for people who talk about web stuff. And I have a Twitter account. You're welcome to follow me or avoid me. So here's the general breakdown of what we're going to cover. I'm going to start with boring statistics. It's impossible, in my opinion, to do a talk on accessibility if you're not at least throwing some statistics out there, partly because you need to make a case and partly because sometimes people just don't understand the scope of everybody they're trying to support. And I'll talk about how we're going to be selfish, walk you through some tests and techniques. Um, this questions ongoing thing, I'm a far more interesting speaker. I think if you're asking questions, if they pop in your head while I go, I'm probably a little bit more interesting, interactive. But if not, that's okay. I will just keep talking. So we're going to start with the boring statistics. Um, and I, I list my sites down at the bottom of the slides. When these are posted later, you'll be able to get to those numbers yourself. But right off the bat, I start off with, in the US, we know that, we know from a number of different sources that within the US, in the 21 to 64 age group, 10% of the population, greater than 10% of the population has a disability of some sort. It's a big number when you think about 10%. And a room with 10 people, one person, and a room with 100 people, 10 people, I'm, I'm bad at math, I'm not gonna do any more than that, but think about your users. Think about 1,000 users to your site. Think about 100,000. Think about a million users to your site. So sort of qualify it that way. Vision impairments. Worldwide, there are a lot of people who've got vision impairments. You can see I've broken these down by ages, and this becomes a bit more relevant as I go through the slides. But you can see as people age, their vision tends to degrade. And you go from about 2% to about 10%, depending on the age group you're targeting. Hearing impairments. Similar trend. You'll see that the number increases. Hearing impairments can include disabling hearing loss, which means they effectively can't hear what you're saying to people who struggle in loud rooms. Um, people like me who worked in front of uh, speaker stacks for years and earplugs or not, I just don't hear my wife when she talks to me. At least that's what I tell her. Um, mobility impairments. This includes everything from tremors to the inability to use limbs to you name it but some form of mobility impairment, which would make it difficult for you to use a mouse, for you to use a keyboard, for you to use any type of pointing device, and insert new and coming technologies. Uh, you know, the, uh, if you use the Xbox and you use your hand to wave to say next video game. So you can see that is also a number that climbs dramatically with age. And then cognitive impairments. Cognitive impairments is probably the one that's most underserved on the web. And I've only thrown up some limited examples. Dyslexia is one I think we've all heard of. Um, dyscalculia, uh, and I probably mispronounced that, is different. It's people who struggle with numbers in the way that dyslexics might struggle with, struggle with words. Uh, memory issues, distractions. The cognitive impairment of the distractions means you're just unable to, to stay focused. You're unable to really key into something. And in the US, you can see that that number I'm, I'm really not taking the crickets personally. <laughs> I'm not. I think it's actually hilarious. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm amazed. I stayed focused. It's crazy. So we can see, again, cognitive impairments tend to increase with age, or at least the, the incidence of them. So I'm going to talk about how to be selfish. You've seen the statistics. You see the numbers. 
you're probably all smart enough that you can make a case for I have to support X number of users, this is my potential revenue stream, it's the right thing to do. Okay, I get that. I'm selfish. I want to be clear, when I do accessibility, it's not about you, it's about me. It's about how it benefits me. And I'm going to walk through that. And I hope you'll bear with me through this, this mental exercise of saying that accessibility should be something that you do strictly to be selfish. Uh, and I should qualify, I stand up here with no impairments. So arguably I'm a fraud. I don't have personal experience being blind, not being able to hear except my wife, um, etc. So I'm a fraud in that regard, which is why I think it's easier for me to make the case that one needs to be selfish. So WebAIM has this wonderful hierarchy for how you motivate people to make accessibility changes within the organization. And they start off by guilting people, and that doesn't work so well, and hopefully you'll move up to punish. And then it becomes a requirement, you mandate it, then you reward them. Hey, good job, you're not a total jerk, here's a piece of chocolate. And enlighten. Okay, you've learned what it is, but ultimately their goal is to inspire people, to inspire them to want to help, to, to understand that it's the right thing to do. And you can see all these things happening when you look at um, the, the legal cases, the lawsuits, everything that, that's hovering around accessibility. And in some cases, the, the, the fact that organizations recognize they'll make more money. It's a great, it, it really is a great model for motivating accessibility change. I had added another layer though. Make it about me. Make it about me as the user. What's going to benefit me? And I have to start to think about, if I can't put myself in the shoes of the people who have these disabilities, I know I can put myself in the shoes of being one of them, either temporarily or in the future. So, one of the key things, I'm going to bet everybody in this room is going to get older. At the very least, you will be 30 minutes closer to dead by the time you leave this room. Um, getting older affects nearly everybody. Uh, it does carry risks and side effects, and as I like to say, it's not for the young. <laughs> I'm hilarious, in case you didn't notice. So th this is the thing that, that I think everybody forgets, is today you can look at a web page with its tiny type as a young developer and you can say, this looks great, and you can build it, and you can do a great job using all the, the buttons and reading all the text and clicking on the tiny things. But in the end, the, the difference between here and here really isn't that much. It's not just time. Sometimes it's a lot of other factors, but time in its ex inexorable slow march to bringing you closer to your doom is gonna walk you through here. I'm sorry, is this coming off a little dark? <laughs> We're all going to get older. There's no way around it. And we all have different expectations and different things that we'll be doing as we age. And we need to account for that. We need to really be prepared to support ourselves as we get older. I wanna make sure that when I am the woman on the left, or, or the man on the left, I suppose, um, that I will still be comfortable using stuff that I built years prior. Yes? So as, as somebody who you know, recently has been losing his close distance vision, and, and hence I'm, I'm like, you know, with the reading glasses, I look at that and I go, why is that woman reading a book rather than a phone? Maybe not because she doesn't like technology, but because the print in the book is big enough for her to see the reading. Right, and, and that's a great point. And at the same time, she could just decide she doesn't want to look at people's pictures of cats or sandwiches. <laughs> I think there's a case for both, yeah. So, okay, so getting older is the thing that's gonna happen to you probably slowly. Accidents can be a little bit more immediate. And accidents can consist of the, the things we're all used to, the things we all know about, broken limbs, damaging your eyes, uh, blowing out your hearing like I may or may not have done, head trauma, I have a little bit of personal experience in that. So accidents take many forms. I, I have some sample photos here because I, I want everybody to understand that this doesn't happen to the people that we always think of we need to support with accessibility. This happens to anybody. This can happen to anybody in this room at any time. Some people are better with the fashion choices. I can't do that with my hair. And that makes me sad. Hey, thank you. So there, there's a lot of stuff that's out of our control. When we want to talk about even um, mental uh, damage, cognitive assault, uh, these are guys in England chasing a wheel of cheese down a hill. 
I argue that there was already something wrong with them <laughs> before they started, but that's, that's just my opinion. So they'll happen anywhere. And, and these guys are having a jolly good time, but it's just as likely one of them is going to get hurt. And a couple of those poses suggest that might be the case. Now, if you are me from 10, 20 years ago, because I am that old, um, I always argued I'm invincible. I'm invincible and I'm allergic to nothing. So as far as I'm concerned, none of this would really apply. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the accessibility features that you build won't benefit you. And again, I am the guy who's always multitasking and doing it poorly. I'm the guy who's working on his laptop or his tablet in a park. I'm the guy who eats at my desk all the time. Um, if any of you saw on Twitter, probably not a few minutes ago, I realized that there's Ghirardelli chocolate smeared on my laptop. It smells kind of nice. Um, I don't always have headphones handy. And I do read lots of sites that aren't in my native language. So this multitasking thing means that you could be trying to eat dinner while surfing the web and watching TV. Um, this, none of these photos are me, by the way. <laughs> but this is absolutely something that I would, would be doing. Um, notice where his one hand is. It's on the keyboard. His other hand is holding his sandwich. He's not using his mouse because he's eating. He's multitasking. This, this is a case of the sunlight. Makes it really, really hard for me to see. Uh, and, I, and I love sitting outside again. Not my photo, not my cat yet. Um, but then you have people who are really, really going all out with it. I mean, these guys are pros. They're in the sun, they're smoking, they're talking on their phone, they're sitting on a tarp. I, I, I kind of want to see if on Google Maps they were there long enough that there's a blue speck in the middle of the field. But this is how a lot of people use technology. This is how a lot of people are getting their stuff done day to day. Neither one of them is using a mouse. Neither one of them is necessarily using a computer in the way that we as developers assume end users are, are, are sitting in front of their computer in a nice office with pleasant lighting in a comfortable chair with no distractions. This guy's my favorite though. Now, I put this in here even though that thing on his lap is not a laptop, it is a typewriter. But here's a guy who's trying to read, trying to keep the sun off himself, terrifying these two young ladies, <laughs> and trying to get something done. I'm telling you, Flickr is full of such great stuff. It really is. And then there are people who are a bit more like me, stealing Wi-Fi from the local cafe, hanging out outside because it's free connection and maybe you're in a foreign city and you've learned the passcode or you're traveling the world and you found Starbucks and oh my god they all use the same Wi-Fi password <laughs> I think I, I've tromped around foreign countries literally Starbucks hopping I've never actually had their coffee in those countries and that's okay Wi-Fi so here's a guy he's working in darkness he's sitting on his lap he's he's bandwidth constrained he's he's got to worry about his battery power all that stuff uh, occasionally you have to rely on headphones and sometimes they go missing. I don't know whose headphones these are, but that guy has them. Uh, sometimes you're in an environment that's just completely foreign to you, literally foreign to you. You're using old technology, you're using broken down technology, you're in a strange blue room in the middle of Sweden. I don't know. But this is another case where not everybody is using the same computer in the same ideal environment. I've been this person. I've been sitting in a cafe in a foreign country on whatever laptop they had, whatever computer they had, trying to sort out a, a passport issue. And I absolutely feel like a, a second class user. And if some of those features, some of the accessibility features had been built in, I would have been better off. One of the nice things about um, headphones is it allows you to get work done when you're sitting out in public. So you can. Uh, watch movies, you can listen to video, you can do whatever you want, and as long as you have the headphones, you're doing all right. You don't always have the headphones and you maybe want to do some work on the web that requires audio and video and you don't want to s disturb your uh, bunkmate. Sometimes your bunkmate doesn't want you to disturb them. But, but the idea here is even, even something like closed captioning has an amazing value for people who aren't actually hard of hearing has amazing value. So if you take a few minutes and you think about, okay, I'm gonna get older. I wanna make sure things are gonna work for me. If you think about, there's a chance I'm going to get injured. I want to make sure things are going to work for me. Or if you think about, 
I don't want to piss off the person I'm living with. These are all factors that if you take those into account and you follow accessibility best practices, you're already helping yourself. You're helping yourself now, you're helping future you, and you're helping the person who's in a constrained environment over which you don't have any control. Um, I tweeted this out uh, back in October and I was amazed how much feedback I got, not just from the retweets and favorites, but everybody is a keyboard user when they're eating with their mouse hand. It's a, it's a simple fact. Uh, now, I mean, you might have a milkshake, you might have a smoothie, you, you might have um, some, some Soylent or Soylent Green, depending on <laughs> the new stuff or the old stuff. But the, the, the truth is, we're, we all are temporarily unable to use things the way that we normally use them. And we need to keep that in mind. I'd also like to point out tech support. This is the thing that happens to me every holiday. Every holiday I visit family members and I have to remember if I'm building software that's better for them to use, it means I have to do less tech support. When I get over to their house on Christmas or Thanksgiving to visit my parents, I don't have to spend a few minutes showing them how to enlarge the type in their browser or how to override some terrible settings that a website has made. So we need to consider that sometimes you're not just helping future you when it comes to dealing with aging issues, you're helping current you because now you're not spending all the time doing tech support on the holidays when you really <coughs> should be drinking that glass of grappa in front of the fire, trying not to catch fire and ignoring all of your family. So the general message I'm trying to get across here is that access supporting accessibility now, today, is going to help future you. Supporting accessibility will help encumbered you. If you're a gamer, that means you're carrying more than your physical strength will allow you to carry. You need a bag of holding. If you don't have a bag of holding. Okay, one person in the room gets that. It was worth a shot. Um, but this really only works if you're teaching the younger developers these same principles. If you're teaching them it's the right thing to do because it helps you. It's also helping your own self. So you, you can't just be selfish by making it great for you. You need, to make, you need to be selfish by telling everybody else to make it great for you, by teaching them the best practices. So I'm going to start to stray into some of these uh, best practices. And I'm putting up some, I'm gonna run through some basic tests. And this is a series of tests that anybody can do. Um, all the tools that I'm going to reference are either immediately available, something you can do today, probably even in this room, and is something that's easy to, easy to replicate. And this doesn't catch everything. These tests won't nail down every accessibility issue, but if you're hitting these things, you're going to catch some of the bigger issues. And if, you're, if, if at least you're starting there, you're a step ahead. So I'm going to use a website that I built for a um, inner city youth soccer program that we put together in, in my hometown of Buffalo a few years ago. Um, so you'll see screenshots related to that. So the first thing, click on field labels. When you encounter a form on a site that you have built, click on the labels. Take your mouse and click. If you know what the label element is and you've done it correctly, it should probably activate the corresponding form field. Whether it's the radio button, whether it's putting focus in the, uh, in the text box, etc. So in this case, I have a contact form and I clicked on the word name and that is supposed to be a blinking cursor. The red arrow is not part of the website. I added that, although I kind of want to. Uh, but click on name, boom, click on any one of those text labels and it's going to put focus in the field. The browser does that automatically. And it isn't just clicking. There are other ways that that label is helpful, but you doing some really quick accessibility tests, click on the label, see if it puts the focus there. That's a pretty straightforward one. Unplug your, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just a comment or maybe a question about this example. I've seen placeholder use of the label in a lot of sites, and I'm kind of behavior is growing increasingly. Um, and I've been wondering, what are your thoughts? Is that acceptable these days? I talked to designers who supposedly are for accessibility, but they want placeholder as a label. Uh, placeholder as label, in my opinion, is a terrible, terrible idea. Um, placeholder text has value, but as soon as they start typing, it goes away. And that's a huge issue, not just for disabled users, but for somebody who's filled out a form and doesn't remember what that field was. If they want to use... slightly distracted. I've, I've had forms where I, I'm thinking of filling it out, and I'm like, clicking something, it goes away, I'm like, wait, what was I supposed to put? Yeah, exactly. And it's painful on mobile when it's a lot of extra typing and swiping. 
So uh, the feedback I'll often give is include the label and if it's really that much of a design issue, use CSS. Use CSS to move it off the screen or to minimize it in some way. And there are some really neat um, there's some really neat examples on the web of people who actually take the label and drop it into the field as if it's placeholder text and when you put focus on the field it moves the label up above the field. I don't, I'm sorry I don't remember a URL off the top of my head but... Also, I'm not sure that screen readers will read out placeholders. Um, that is a, I, I don't know. I haven't run the screen readers through that. My, my immediate feedback is never rely just on the placeholder. Um, unplug your mouse. This one's pretty easy. I almost knocked this over. That'd be hilarious. So I have this nice mouse that I unplug and uh, I then go through and see if I can still use the site. Can I tab my way through the, through the entire site? Can I get to all the menus? Can I tell which item has focus? So flyout menus, really popular. Without a mouse, kind of a pain in the ass. So start tabbing. If you can't get into those sub-menus, those flyout menus via keyboard, you gotta fix that. You really need to address that. And it needs to be styled in a way that makes sense. Not only that, but the tab order has to, has to make sense. If I start tabbing and boom, I end up in the footer and then boom, I back up in the, he back up in the header, I've got a bit of a problem. Uh, in the case of this site, one thing that I allow is the outline. So I've tabbed over to coaching staff and it gets the outline. I could take it a step further and give it the same focus style, which I actually have done, which is why it's uh, green, if you can tell the color, um, because it should be the same experience. Um, if you are working on a site and uh, your, your developer at any point has taken outline and set it to none in the CSS, slap them. It's not necessarily wrong, but there are, there are other things that they'll need to do to make up for that going away. So don't just go in by default. When you grab a, um, uh, I forget what the, a CSS library, basically a pre-built, simple a CSS, reset a CSS reset, et cetera, look for that and gut it. Just get rid of it. You're, you're doing yourself some harm because now you need to really spend some extra time testing all of that. Turn off images. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you talk a little more about tabbing order and how to design your, your tabbing order by default would be the source order of the page. As soon as you start throwing tab indices into things, you're throwing everything off. So, uh, and I'm sorry I cut you off before you're done with your question, but I'm gonna answer and let you go back to it. Uh, my feedback is don't use tab indices. But did you have more to the question? Well, my feedback is get the page source in the right order because with CSS, it's pretty trivial to move things around to where you want them to appear. And if, you're already, if you've already adopted a responsive model, you probably are already moving content around in order to linearize the page. And a linearized page is very similar to a page uh, that you're going to be tabbing through anyway. So take a look at your linearized version, take a look at your source order, see if it syncs up, and try to do that. There are cases where there are absolutely exceptions. And, and I know when that's tough, but that's something you have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. I just know that there are free sources on general guidelines. Because again, it's not something that I assume right. any kind of page source is not going to be valuable at this point. The fun thing about accessibility is you can't solve it with a checklist. You, you, have, to, you have to go through and you have to test it. And even though I'm giving you a checklist of approaches, when you start to get into that level of detail, you really need, do need to sit down and spend some time with it. I think I said this already, didn't I? Turn off your images. There are lots and lots of sites that rely on text in their images, that rely on the image conveying the concept of the site or relaying instructions to the end user, and that can be a really tough thing when the images don't load. Here's the thing, turning off images isn't a, isn't a thing that your users typically do. They don't surf the web with images off. That's, that's just absurd. What they do is they surf the web on a constrained connection and sometimes the images don't download. What they do is they surf the web with low vision or with the screen zoomed in and they can't see the entire image. Turn off the images. Has your content fallen away? 
Can you still use the site? Is the alt text useful? So here's the, the site with the images on. Here it is with the images off. Now you'll note that the picture of the kid doesn't have alt text behind it. It's an alt equals quote quote. It is blank. It is empty because it is strictly a decorative image and I'm okay without conveying photo of a kid chasing after a soccer ball who three seconds later landed on his face and we all laughed and felt terrible about it. <laughs> the navigation items at the top, those icons go away. That's not a problem. The text is still there. The logo in the upper left goes away, but it still says Buffalo Soccer Club in the alt text. That's okay. So as you go through and you turn off images, do things still make sense? The social media icons, for example, do have alt text, but in the visual browser, the, the area to display the alt text is too small, so you're not going to see it. If you're using any assistive technology, you'll still hear the alt text. High contrast mode. High contrast mode is a, a Windows only feature. It is awesome. It is also something that a lot of developers don't have experience with, uh, particularly when they find out that background images and all of your colors get replaced. So you saw what the site looked like a minute ago. Well, here, here's the site and high contrast mode. Yeah, it's like a rave, a <laughs> terrible, terrible rave. So you can see it's basically gone black or white. All of my background images have gone. Well, conveniently, because I already accounted for the missing background images in my design, that's not a big deal. And my colors are replaced, that's okay. There are media queries. There is a, uh, an IE only media query that will allow you to identify if the user is in high contrast mode and then you can do other things with that in your styles but other browsers aren't going to necessarily uh, other browsers aren't going to honor that so make sure that your page makes sense in high contrast mode um, one of my favorite things to do to uh, sites so when I'm reviewing them for clients is turn off the CSS as a developer this should be pretty trivial for you but it's important to test. And it's not just because of users on constrained connections, it's also because a lot of users on assistive technology aren't processing the CSS. They aren't seeing it, they aren't experiencing it. And they're seeing the, the page in the source order of the code and in the, the structural HTML that you have used to uh, encode the page. So if you have error messages and uh, suddenly they aren't visible or they appear somewhere else, okay. Does the content order make sense? Um, are there still styles on the page? Well, that's a clue right off. If you get an error message and it's heavily styled, maybe you're accidentally drawing your styles in with your error message, with your script, instead of relying on a class. And maybe you haven't built it to be as flexible as it could be. So when I turn off the CSS for this site, it's okay. Now I scrolled down so you could see the content, uh, but above this is a big nested bullet list of all the navigation. And then below this is a couple more uh, pairs of lists that have all the footer information but ideally there's my breadcrumb there's my picture there's my text the site makes sense it, it should continue to make sense um, testing for color blindness is not just color blindness in itself but also contrast um, I, I think I did include in one of the earlier slides maybe I didn't maybe I forgot uh, numbers for colorblind users worldwide or in the US maybe I forgot that in which case when I post the slides later I'll have to update that but what you want is that all the things that people need to use on the site the hyperlinks the menus maybe the pictures maybe the really important information maybe the warning text etc is still visible um, I've linked to some tools so when you grab these slides later on those hyperlinks should work just fine and if not I'll pull them out but there are a lot of tools out there that can help you do some quick color contrast testing and they will mimic the effect of different levels of color blindness. So here's a soccer club if you have protonopia. Here it is if you have deuteranopia. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing these. Tritonopia. So you can see the colors change pretty dramatically, but you can still see the content. You can still see the links. Could be better. I could improve it. But the gist is it's still there. And what's really nice is there are ratios already defined in the specifications that tell you what ratios to use so that you can bypass most of those concerns. I thought I had another slide after this. You might have all heard about how Google dropped the underlines on its hyperlinks. 
Maybe you didn't, maybe you did. I think that's um, fine for Google because as users, we tend to know what is the hyperlink. The page is pretty consistent in its layout and it has been for a long time. Unfortunately, that's causing some developers to decide that they can do the same thing on their sites. And there are plenty of sites that are doing that and don't have sufficient color contrast. And now the links are essentially invisible once you remove the hyperlinks. So the gist there is don't rely on color alone to convey the information. You know, make sure that there's still some other indicator, whether it's the underline, whether maybe it's an icon. Again, visual versus not. So make sure that you're, you're accounting for that. Uh, look for captions and transcripts. So if your site has video or audio, um, and again, if you've ever tried to watch or listen to this video or audio when you're in bed with your spouse, you find it can be kind of annoying. So captions and transcripts can be really, really helpful. Uh, let's all discount the fact that transcripts get can or should be indexed by the search engines so they have a potential benefit for your SEO, because I think SEO is mostly a lie, but there's a potential benefit there. Um, so do your video and audio clips have text alternatives? Are, are there closed captions available? Um, is there an audio description available? I've included some links to some tools so that you can get into doing captioning uh, built right into YouTube and Vimeo and then uh, WebVTT, which is the, um, the uh, text transcription. I probably got that wrong now. Bugger. Um, there's a tutorial on how to do that so you can make your own so you don't have to lean on Vimeo and YouTube. You can write your own uh, captions and transcripts. Um, I found a video on YouTube. I include the link at the bottom of the slide. This is a, a full movie, the, the Lady Vanishes. It's got an audio description, so while you're watching it, there is somebody telling you everything that's going on on screen, and it's got closed captions. Um, for me, that's a little too much information. Uh, really, I can't handle anything more complex than an explosion every 12 minutes or so. Uh, but it was still really interesting to see, and it's a, it's a good indicator of what's available. And then down in the bottom right corner, uh, there are other languages. Spanish is, is also an option. So audio, video, transcripts, when you can. Yes? Just, just, just to clarify on, on the audio descriptions versus transcripts and so on, I think very few people would ever use both of those at the same time. I mean, the, the closed captioning is for people who can't hear, and the audio description is for people who can't see. Yes. Yes. Uh, there, there are people who may use them both at the same time. Uh, if but they might be interested in getting additional information about the video that they otherwise wouldn't know. Um, those cases may be rare, but I don't want to prejudge, but yours is a good point. Hyperlinks. You may know this. The web is built around hyperlinks. The magic of the web is about the hyperlink. So it seems kind of important that your hyperlinks should make sense. And this isn't just about visual, it's about it making sense. If you wade through the home page of your site and you got that column that's got all your press releases and they all end with more, click here, link to, uh, click, click here in particular. I'd, I'd like to think everybody, if you're sitting in this room, has already struggled with click here and has already fought that fight about, no, we can't have everything on the page say click here because we know the screen readers, when they get to it, will just read a page of click here, click here, click here, which is a terrible techno song, which will go great with that rave slide I had earlier. But it's, it's awful. So I'd like to think you're kind of familiar with that. So just extend it. More. Link to. Doesn't work. Are you using all caps? Uh, this is important because sometimes a screen reader will pronounce it as if it is a, um, uh, an acronym. Instead of thinking that it's supposed to shout, it starts spelling out words. Um, linking to URLs is painful if you're using a screen reader. Emoticons mean nothing. You should be warning your users before you're popping new windows. You should try and give them a an indicator if they're downloading a file, and that should be a plain text indicator. Hey, you're about to download a five meg PDF. Okay, that's a parenthetical statement. There's no special technology to do that. Just include it in your copy. Um, pagination links can be particularly difficult if it's just a string of numbers at the bottom of a page, if there's no context. So give those a test. Make sure that they make sense. Make sure that when you're listening to the page or walking through the page that it actually fits. Um, I talked about underlined links. Um, alt text for image links. Sometimes the image won't display. The alt text means that there'll still be something there, so now you'll be clicking on a big broken image icon and have a sense of where it is you're going. Um, and is the link text consistent? Uh, I grabbed this example, which in retrospect I should have moved earlier in the slides, but the only difference between these three screenshots is the type of low vision. Deuteranopia on the top, Protonopia at the top, at the bottom, 
and the middle one is the default. So this site uses orange with no underlines for its hyperlinks. And you can see in those two examples of color blindness, the links recede pretty effectively, which means it can be pretty hard to identify what is a link when you're quickly scanning the page. Uh, now I've talked, you've heard me talk a lot about vision stuff and before I jump into the next set where I've got 10 minutes left for that I think, before I jump into the techniques, I want to point out accessibility is not about vision. It's not about blind users, not about low vision. Uh, I think it's worth repeating this every time I talk about accessibility that there are far, far more cases of users with impairments of some form that aren't vision. So if you think that you're testing any screen reader and that's enough, it's not enough. If you think you're testing in Chromevox for screen readers and that's enough, it's not enough. You, you need to really experiment with other technologies and you really need to experiment as a user through some of these techniques that I've outlined here and understand that it's more than just vision. Okay. I'm going to jump into some techniques and if I recall correctly, this is the last section. I've got 10 minutes and of course, keep asking questions as we go. Has everybody here heard of ARIA? Okay, I'm getting a lot of nodding heads, a couple emphatic hands up in the air. So trend is most of you have. The gist here is that ARIA is, a, is an output of the Web Accessibility Initiative and it is intended to create more accessibility hooks where maybe they aren't otherwise available, partly to address current limitations in HTML and current limitations in how people code HTML. So it adds the accessibility information and it works in older versions of HTML. I tried this accidentally with a bunch of HTML4 sites. And even though it was just officially published a couple months ago, it's been in the wild for years. People have been using it for a while and 1.1 is currently going through the, uh, the, the standards process. So there are, if you look at the current spec, there are three rules, three rules of ARIA use. The draft spec has four, and they just added a fifth a couple days ago, which meant I had to revise these slides. So here are the, here are the core rules of ARIA use, and I want to run through these because I don't want everybody to think that ARIA is automatically going to make things accessible, that you can just sprinkle it in and it works. If you have a native HTML5 element that has the semantics built in, use that. And I'll show you some examples later on. If you've, there's already a button element. There's already a header element. There's already a footer element. There's already a hyperlink. So you don't need to strap ARIA onto that because those things already just do it. Don't change native semantics. A heading one is a heading one. It's not a button, so don't go giving it a roll button because I've seen that and it's terrible and it's confounding to the people who benefit most from, from ARIA. Is it a heading? Is it a button? Which is it? You've changed it. It no longer is doing what it's supposed to do. You're not double dipping. You're not getting two benefits. Yes? So, I'm not sure why in the world you would have an H1 that you want it to be a button or anything like that, but it, so, that sounds like a really horrible design to begin with. But supposing for some reason you needed to do that, what would you suggest? I would suggest that you still have your H1 and if you absolutely need a button, something that acts like a button in there, put a button element inside your H1. Or, you know, take a step back and say, why the hell do I need an H1 with a button in it? Um, all interactive ARIA controls must be usable with the keyboard. This is pretty easy to test if you follow the, the general testing rules I mentioned before. Tab your way through the screen. Go through it and make sure it works. But keyboard users must be able to perform equivalent actions. It doesn't need to be exactly the same, but equivalent. If you have an on-click event, for example, you know, it's just like having an on-mouse down. The idea here is they still need to be able to do the same stuff. So if you have an ARIA control, make sure the keyboard works. Do not use role presentation or ARIA hidden true if the element is supposed to receive focus. Then they can't ever focus it. You may have the, the best thing that you're trying to do and you might have a button on the page and then you put role equals presentation on it. Well, guess what? It won't ever receive focus because you've told the browser, nope, ignore the semantics on this. It's just here for show. And the fifth just added rule is all interactive elements must have an accessible name. Um, and that name comes, can come from the visible text on a button, for example, or the alt text on an image. But it needs to have something for the assistive technology to hook into to either pronounce, announce, or define 
for the end user in some way. Like a button. Yeah. Or tabs. Or, and so on down the line. Anything where the user interacts. Tabs. Tabs. Yeah, sorry. So those are the three slash five rules of ARIA use. If any of you is a Douglas Adams fan, this should be funny to you. <laughs> I'm laughing for you. Okay. <laughs> so the, the danger with ARIA is um, what Hayden Pickering has so eloquently demonstrated, again, for the one gamer in the room, uh, role-playing. So you've got a div. Just because you say that its role is a dwarf doesn't mean you've changed it. You've put a hat on it and given it a terrible beard, and it should be shorter because it's a dwarf. But that being said, here's, here's an example of what not to do in ARIA. Um, and really, this is an example of what not to do. Uh, I'm building up. This is what not to do in HTML first. Don't put a non-click handler on a div. Don't think you're making it okay because you give it a tab index zero because now somebody can tab to it. Okay, now you remember the, the, the keyboard, good for you. Oh, now I've given it a roll button. I've added ARIA, I'm done, it's accessible, I'm the best, where's my award? This is great. Don't, don't do this. This, this, is, this is terrible. Look at all the code you've had to put in there when you can just have a button and you can still have your on click and on key press if you want. But frankly, in many cases, you don't always need all the extra details, but boom, now it's a button. It is a native element. I am not adding ARIA to something where it doesn't belong, and I have not, in fact, created any ARIA soup. I'm just using the native element. So the best thing you can do in ARIA is first find that native element and go with that. Um, I included, uh, I could rant about this for a while, but frankly, two other people who are far more skilled than I have ranted about it. And I've included links which will be available in the slide, uh, in the slides afterward. Um, HTML5 elements, there are elements already built into HTML5 that do a lot of this stuff. Uh, the main element, if you go by the W3C specification, allows one per page. If you go by the Whatwig specification, it's more nuanced than that, as in you can allow more than one per page. And a form, in this case a search form. Um, they don't always have the support that you want in assistive technologies, so for now, still add the roles. Uh, this is particularly handy when you have elements that should be once per page, such as your, your content info for your footer, or your banner for your header, or your role main. So when we look at the generic desktop layout, very generic desktop layout, you can see how I've broken it down using HTML5 elements with the ARIA roles, which I'm still suggesting you use for now. And by the way, it transitions just fine when we go to a mobile air quote layout and I say mobile because this is really responsive with a narrow screen it doesn't imply anything beyond that um, HTML5 headings N nice thing about HTML5 headings is they already impart document structure if you have read anything about HTML5 in, in recent years you've probably seen them talk about the HTML5 document outline it's a myth it doesn't exist um, there's some great articles talking about how beneficial it is and it's not, it's nonsense. Um, so use HTML, use the HTML headings, H1 through H6, as if there was no sectioning, because it's going to be far more accurate for the users who benefit from it the most. Because no browser is going to recognize that a section with an H1 is actually a, an H3, because it's already under an H1 and H2. Um, little, little fun fact down there, NCSA Mosaic had an H7 in the first release because they apparently thought we needed more than just that. So I talk about the document outline algorithm. Um, you'll see a lot of articles discrediting it. There's a link at the bottom of this where you can read my rant about it. I'm not going to trouble you with that. So what it comes down to is we're, we're stumbling into this world where ARIA offers a whole lot of really nifty ways to enhance your page. But as a result, that and HTML5 were starting to get into the same thing we used to encounter with divs everywhere. Sections are popping up everywhere. People are putting um, ARIA roles on things, et cetera. And this can overwhelm users of assistive technology. To remind you, you might be that user. Again, I'm trying to bring that back around. So here's some simple rules I use. If it doesn't get a, a special heading, maybe you don't need that sectioning element. Um, if it shouldn't be in the document outline, you probably don't need it. Uh, I've said these as absolutes. They're really a little bit more nuanced than that, but it's, it's a good place to start. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make up a little bit of time here, which 
I can do very quickly. Um, alternative text. There have been some changes in alternative text and what is allowed and what is supported. Um, if I'm asking you which is correct, technically all of these are correct. Um, ARIA labeled by, which means it's labeled by the text in the paragraph, ARIA label, which means the label's in line, title even, alt. I, I'm not a big fan of that, so I'm still going to tell people to use alt uh, because it's consistent, it's easy, it's much easier to explain to other developers. Um, I'd also like to point out that there is such a thing called long desk, which allows you to provide a URL to a much longer description. Um, and this is a particularly ranty subject of mine, uh, given the nature of infographics across the web. They're everywhere. And they're inaccessible by their very nature. And it, <laughs> so uh, even when I write stuff, the rare times I include an infographic, I will include a long desk link to it. The browsers don't yet support long desk, so just include the link to it underneath saying, by the way, long description, and boom, there is all the information that was in the graphic. But it's sort of a future-friendly coding thing, and even if the browser doesn't support it, it gets you in the habit of recognizing that that big wordy image isn't necessarily recognized by all of the end users. There is an alternative text decision tree built into the specification. I have a link at the bottom. I'm not going to walk you through this. This is, this is about as close to a word art as I was willing to get for this slide. Um, so you can look that up on your own time. Um, I think I am technically wrapping it up on time and leaving the 10 minutes necessary for questions, feedback, corrections, rants, sandwiches. Yes? So accessibility and these things are smart for SEO and for the users, um, but it's sometimes compelling uh, or hard to compel business decision makers uh, to sign off on these things, which can be expensive to implement. From a dev perspective, do you have any um, links to research that we can show that there's ROI on these things? None in these. None in these slides, no. And um, frankly, the, 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 there are, the W3C has a great article on my business case for accessibility, and I don't know if I put it in here. No, I did this more as, as technical. I include some resources links at the end. But W3C has an article about um, making a business case to your employer. It's a good starting point, but every organization is going to have different things that are important to them. So if I'm making this case to Amazon, I want to be able to demonstrate that they're going to get more sales. If I'm making this case to a nursing home, I want to demonstrate that the 50, 60 year old children of the people who might be coming there can actually see the content on the website. Right, but that's still technical implementation, but not necessarily just, um, I mean, that's kind of a case by case yes. for your business, but um, nothing kind of overall sweeping that we want to make the web everywhere more accessible. Again, I'll refer you back to the W3C's uh, document, which is the business case for accessibility. And I'm sorry I don't have the link in here, but I can tweet that out later. Um, I, have, I have three screens of resources at the end here. Um, the only thing you need to write down right now that you don't need to write down, because they're going to post it on the site anyway, is I have a URL for where I'll be posting the slides shortly after I get off stage, provided I have Wi-Fi and remember my password. Other questions? Because we've still got some time, and I love to talk. Yes? Are there any uh, frameworks that um, can be um, I, I am, I am, yeah, I'm really uncomfortable with a lot of frameworks for a variety of reasons. Uh, partly because the people who baked in any accessibility features didn't have a good understanding of it. And you'll see that there's, there's ARIA soup, and you'll see that they don't have um, focus events for keyboard users. Um, bootstrap is one I've been particularly critical of in my writing, but at the same time, uh, the U.S. government, uh, CMS, which is, um, uh, it's, it's the, it's, I've, now I've forgotten what it stands for, it's the branch of the government that's dealing with all the health care laws. CMS has created their own assets uh, site, assets.cms.gov, I believe it is, and you can go there and you can grab what is effectively Bootstrap 2 that they have cleaned up and built in a lot of accessibility. So it's a great one to take a look through and maybe to start with. It doesn't have all the latest and greatest stuff on it, but at the same time, you're probably not going to need to worry as much about accessibility compliance when using that library. And I think the Canadian government has one as well. And um, the UK has a style guide, but I don't think they've codified it into a library. I think it's assets.cms.gov. Yes? Bootstrap, 
number two, okay. as opposed to bootstrap also. Right, which means if you're using Bootstrap 3, you would be going back a version, right. which is the risk, and then you have to weigh that. Yeah. Okay. Yes? I had a question about how charts, specifically charts more um, uh, This is one of those awful answers where it depends, but depending on how that chart is built, if you're, if you're making it keyboard accessible and you're not relying on images and there's text in those charts, you're already off to a good start. And then you can start to explore, what does the chart do? Does it hide content? Does it show content? Maybe ARIA tabs is a great way to flip through it. Maybe there's another, maybe an ARIA tree view is a great way to do it. So start to build it first and experiment with the mouse and the keyboard and, and listening to it and see if it works. And then where are the, the, where the gaps exist that you can't fill with a native HTML, go in and see if ARIA can, can save your butt, really. Yes? So when, when testing with JAWS, it's sometimes it's not intuitive as a Steam user. Mm -hmm. Yep. What's, I mean, there's sort of the basics of can I act on the screen, but do you have any tips in terms of understanding what makes that better or worse? Those, yeah, the feedback I have for that is the same feedback I've been giving for years, which isn't always great. Um, grab NVDA, grab JAWS, and get used to them, and then find your local blind association and visit them. And there's going to be somebody there who's savvy, and even if they're not, ask them to walk through it. Because as a sighted user, I know from all the testing I've done in screen readers, I don't, I, I'm not a user, I don't understand what they're struggling with. So I can very quickly grab somebody and say, help me out here. And they're going to usually be very good about giving you feedback. And they're going to tell you things that you never considered. And just for that alone is absolutely worth it. Any other questions? Yes? Any special Um, I, I, I left a lot of the, the um, touch interface stuff out of here because I'm still getting used to it. But with the change in touch events, with the really neat stuff that uh, iOS has done for accessibility and how far back Android is lagging, even though it's getting better, uh, even with the Windows Mobile and where it's coming along, I'm, I'm, I'm still not up to speed on all of that. So I'm, I'm very careful about making recommendations on mobile because I'm just not that level of a user or developer. So I don't know yet. Other questions? Yes? Do you have some sense of um, what percentage of blind people are using the latest and greatest version of their screen reader as opposed to uh, a couple versions? No, sa sadly I do not. Um, I know from anecdotal evidence from local organizations and people I talk to uh, that people are often lagging one or two releases behind, but that's completely anecdotal. And I recommend that you go and take a look at uh, Freedom Scientific site or whomever is a maker or supporting them and see what the general feedback is. Yes? No. I mean, technically, yes, there's been a push for media queries to detect screen readers. And while it's, there are ways to do it, uh, there's been a lot of resistance to it, which I agree with, because now you start to give them a different experience, which is bad. I had a whole slide series of slides I cut out of here related to that. Um, so you're going to have to make some best guesses, but for the most part, those are tools that strap on top of the browser and don't report themselves in the user agent string. Yes? Are there any additional complexities when you overlay multiple languages as well? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It never gets managed. It gets lost. It gets swept under the carpet. Look at us. We did something nice and we're done with it. And it doesn't get maintained at the same way. And frankly, not a lot of people are building their content systems to support multiple versions anyway. So you might have a great idea on how you build it. But when the admin assistant is updating all the press releases, he or she might not know that they need to tag it in a special way or push it out in two different places or anything related to that. So it helps you as a developer and it helps the user to make everything behave as much the same way as possible to the same interface to the same experience. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and and I, I have to turn it over here. So thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Nobody fell asleep. That's a good sign. Thank you.